Why is Good Friday good? Good Friday is good because the price we couldn't pay got paid and the stain we couldn't clean got clean. Good Friday is good because the world was without hope, but the lamb was without blemish. Good Friday is good because the worst thing that could ever happen was simultaneously the best thing that would ever happen. Good Friday is good because on that cross, on that day, the great shepherd of the sheep walked through the valley of the shadow of death for us. Good Friday is good because even though the cross isn't pretty, it's beautiful. Good Friday is good because if we have a king who would rather die for his enemies than kill them. Good Friday is good because I am not good, but he is. Good Friday is good because Friday is not the end of the story. Hi, and welcome to some Good Friday Time in the Word with Richmond Hill Community Church. Up front today, I'm going to invite you to turn your scriptures to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to read from chapter 23, verses 26 to 43. That's Luke 23, 26 to 43. So whatever you're using to experience God's Word um, at the moment, whether that's your paper Bible or some digital resource, Um, invite you to turn to Luke with me in these moments, and we're going to read together. It says this, As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, that wombs, the wombs rather, that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for what for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word today. As we meet here today, this morning, we find ourselves in the thick of it. 
Good Friday is here. And we're standing in the shadow of the cross, a crucial instrument in the lives of those who have decided to follow Jesus. In and around the time of Jesus, it was used as a method of execution, as an instrument of death. And although many of us know this fact, it's often hard for us to fully comprehend the gravity of its purpose. So I decided to do a little digging this year to refresh my own mind about the reality of death on a cross. Let me share a little bit of what I found. It was called crucifixion. And although it wasn't invented by the Romans, it certainly was perfected by them as the ultimate execution by torture. It was designed to inflict the maximum amount of pain and the maximum amount of shame. In Rome, they were carried out in public so that all who saw the horror would be deterred from crossing the Roman government. Crucifixion was, in fact, so horrible that it was reserved for only the absolute worst offenders. Try to imagine experiencing these realities. First, you are severely beaten. An ordeal that is life-threatening in and of itself. And then you are forced to carry the large wooden crossbeam that would ultimately be, to what would ultimately be, rather, the site of your death. Bearing this load is not only extremely painful after the beating, but it adds a new level of shame as you are carrying the instrument of your own torture and death. It is like digging your own grave. When you arrive at the place of crucifixion, you are stripped naked to further shame you. Then you are forced to stretch out your arms on the cross beam where they are, where they are nailed in place. The nails are hammered through your wrists, not the palms, which keeps the nails from pulling through your hands. The placement of the nails causes excruciating pain as they press on large nerves running to your hands. The crossbeam is then hoisted up and fastened to an upright piece that would normally remain standing between crucifixions. After fastening the crossbeam, the executioners nail your feet to the cross as well, normally one foot on top of the other, nailed through the middle and the arch of each foot with your knees slightly bent. Once you are fastened to the cross, all your weight is supported by these three nails, which cause unbearable pain to course throughout your body. Your arms are stretched out in such a way as to cause cramping and paralysis in your chest muscles, making it literally impossible for you to breathe unless some of the weight was supported by the feet. In order to take a breath, you have to push yourself up with your feet. And after taking that breath, in order to relieve some of the pain in your feet, you begin to slump down again. However, You cannot breathe in this lowered position. So before long, the torturous cycle begins again. This horrid process repeats over and over and over and leads to a slow, agonizing death. Truly and absolutely horrible to imagine. Death on a cross was considered worse than death by decapitation or being killed by wild animals or being burnt alive. It was a punishment during which the impulses and brutality of the executioners were given full 
reign. It was a fate which none of us can truly fathom. An impossible reality to come to terms with, but a reality nonetheless. On a cross like this one, in a way like I've just described, in this way, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave up his life. This is where our passage brings us this morning, to face the reality of the cross, an invention whose intention was to bring about the end of life in the most painful and shameful way possible. And yet we are forced to consider that all of this was a part of God's plan for his son Jesus. It can be hard to wrap our heads around it. That is, until we zoom out and we view things from a wider perspective. As we step back to see the bigger picture, we find that a cross intended to inflict a shameful death. Through the sacrifice of his son Jesus, God turned into an instrument of glorious restoration. The scene from our passage read earlier of Jesus and the two thieves is one that has always stuck out in my mind as one of the greatest examples of redemption in all of the scriptures. And that's because for both of these thieves that day, the situation that they were in were, was as shameful and as painful as it could possibly have been. Yet on those crosses, in their final hours, at the end of their lives, God stepped in and created a space for redemption and restoration. As the story goes, one thief realized this, while the other thief didn't. The repentant thief realized that amid his pain, shame, and utter condemnation, there was an opportunity, an opportunity for his pain, shame, and condemnation to ultimately be taken away and for new life to be restored. Not because of anything that he could do, but entirely because, what, because of what Jesus was in the process of doing. Over the course of the past couple of weeks, um, I came across a post on social media by Pastor Matt Prater of New Hope Church in Brisbane, Australia. He shares the words of Alex Sage. It says this, How does the thief on the cross fit into your theology? No baptism. No communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trip, no volunteerism, no church attendance, no Sunday school, no financial gifts, and no church clothes. He couldn't even bend his knees to pray. He didn't say the sinner's prayer, and among other things, he was a thief. Jesus didn't take away his pain, heal his body, or smite his scoffers in those moments. Yet it was a thief who walked into paradise the same hour he died simply by believing. He had nothing more to offer other than his belief that Jesus was who he said he was. No spin from brilliant theologians, no ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, no, no skinny jeans or crafty words, no fog machine, donuts, no coffee in the lobby. Just a naked, dying man on a cross 
unable to even fold his hands in prayer. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is the good news of the gospel. Then Matt Prater adds these thoughts of his own. Please understand, many of these things listed above are beneficial, even critical, but not necessarily required for salvation. Those things strengthen our walk of faith, and if possible, we should desire to participate and experience those things. Yet, the gospel is simple. God desires relationship. And it all begins with surrender, submission, and belief. All of which happened with that thief on the cross. Wow. You see, in a situation of imminent death, with nothing left, When found at the end of himself, new life was offered. The choice was clear, and this thief chose to believe. The thief chose life. This amazing scene from the Word of God is a great example that it's never too late to reach out to God and ask that He be the difference maker in our lives. We are given the same choice as these two thieves as we live day to day in our own individual experiences. God has created through the work of His Son the opportunity to leave behind us the perceived or the potential shame and condemnation of our past and move forward in a relationship with him. He is still in the business of removing the emotional barriers of shame in the lives of his people and leading them out of the darkness and into the light of freedom and restoration. He is still rolling stone. I was reminded of the magnificent truth in the words of Romans 8, 1 and 2. It says this, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The message paraphrase puts it this way. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. You see, far too often we live our lives in perceived condemnation, either the condemnation that we place on ourselves or the condemnation that others speak over us. We let shame define us, control us, and even prevent us from living the lives of freedom that God has intended. What absolute rubbish. Why would we ever Continue to live in shame and condemnation when God has freely given the opportunity 
for new and abundant life. This Easter season, and always, we must remember that as His children, we find our identity in Him. Our perceived shame does not define us. We are who He says we are. As we consider what the reality of the cross means for each one of us this Easter, may we always remember that the powerful and atoning work of Jesus continues to break the bonds of sin and shame in the lives of people each and every day. And as we move closer and closer to Resurrection Sunday, may we know more fully the power that we have in relationship with God to face our past mistakes with resilience. May we know more fully that we serve a resurrected Lord who conquers sin and death and shame. May we know more fully that He continues to give us the ongoing gift of restoration, of new life found only in Him. And may we know more fully that He is still rolling stones. Join me in prayer in these moments. Father God, we thank you in these moments for the reality of the cross. We thank you um, for the reality of redemption and restoration. God, we thank you that there is no longer condemnation for those who find themselves in relationship with you. And so God, as we take a few more moments today to consider what your cross means for us personally. May we never forget that on that day, you stretched out your arms in love for all whom you created. God, we thank you for the free gift of salvation. And I want to pray for anybody in these moments who may be listening to my voice and may not be in a relationship with your son, Jesus. Help them to understand the freedom that comes with this gift that you so readily give. Help them to connect with you. Help them to more fully understand your great love for them and that this Easter season would be the season when they gloriously come into relationship with you. So God bless the remaining time. Help us to reflect as we listen and sing along perhaps with the words of the following song. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. King would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. to see. 
There's a place for me I'm a child 